Bliss and Grit is an entirely listener-supported show. Supporting us is also designed to support you through keeping the episodes rolling, but also through rewards for your donation, like a getting started guide, a private forum, and downloadable meditations. To become a supporting member, you can visit patreon.com forward slash bliss and grit. Hello, beautifuls. You're listening to Bliss and Grit. I'm Vanessa Scotto, and I'll be joined soon by my dear friend and co-host, Brooke Thomas. On the show, we're talking about being on the embodied spiritual path. And what does that actually mean? What is a real evolution of our lives? How do we ultimately embrace everything? All the beauty and crazy, the joys and the messes, the bliss and the grit that is a human life. This week, we're going deeper on a conversation we had a few months back on awakening and the nervous system. Through numerous personal experiences, recent interviews we've done, and a course we've been taking with a teacher named Neelam on the awakening nervous system, we've been getting an even more profound understanding of the role the nervous system may play in recognizing our true nature. From discussing what it means to actually be present, to the basics of polyvagal theory and tools that we can use to create shifts, in this episode, we're exploring the fascinating world of the human nervous system. If you've been enjoying the show, you know we are always delighted if you take time to leave a review on iTunes or on our Facebook page, which is Bliss and Grit. You can also head over to our website on blissandgrit.com to send us emails, to subscribe to our weekly digest, or to find out more about becoming a supporting member at Patreon. One last thing before we head into the conversation. Sometimes Brooke and I do curse. So just in case you're in mixed non-swearing company, you may want to wear some headphones. Okay, everyone, here we go. Hello, Vanessa. Hello, honey. So we have lately both been um, listening to, reading, or talking with a variety of teachers, and there's a common theme emerging among all of them and, and for us. And of course, all teachers are pointing to the same thing. So it's not like shocking that there's a common theme, but it's just, of course, like that whatever is resonant or most noticeable for us at any given time. And that it's going on for both of us, of course, makes for good convo here on the podcast. Absolutely. (laughs) So we had a lovely conversation with Locke Kelly for our last episode. And um, we have Matt Kahn coming up. And you had a retreat with him recently. And we both did, you did the whole course. And I did one of the classes with um, Neelam on awakening and the nervous system. So the theme that's coming up is basically, for me, that there is this, I'm noticing how much teachers are pointing to this really basic, if we can take it out of spiritual woo-woo land, which we always want to do, we can talk about this process of awakening or maturation of consciousness as as a physiological thing, and that the physiology of that is all about the capacity of the nervous system, um, which we've talked about before. But it's really fascinating when you have life experience that gives you a really guided tour of the nervous system. So for me, going through some stuff lately where I've been feeling really triggered, which we'll talk about more later in the episode. So seeing just how much these ideas about different dimensions of reality are really different dimensions of capacity within my nervous system or where my nervous system is locating. So we can talk about autonomic nervous system. Um, we can talk about vagal nerve function and just like, how do we have adaptable, resilient nervous systems? And what happens when we inevitably get triggered by something and get put into a less mature part of the brain that's really much more oriented just towards the survival of the organism at all costs. Um, So 
Yeah, I just would love to pull that thread out from both of our lives right now and also from some of the teachers that we're really paying attention to. Because what if, like, as we get into new paradigm of spirituality, what if one of the things we can do is just say, forget all of the, the stuff, you know, what you wear and what words you use and what vows you take and all those things are beautiful and wonderful in their own way. But if we just want to, like, really, really make it simple or if we just want to, like, help our Western brains do something Western brains can do, <laughs> say, it. let's really look at the adaptability, the flexibility, the range of any given person's nervous system. And that will tell you a lot about where they're able to locate in terms of their consciousness and where they're, because of that, where they're able to live from in terms of their consciousness. And when I say that, what I mean is the difference between um, suffering and feeling like you're in hell and having access to a much broader view where you have, you know, the ability to not force upon yourself states that you've heard are good, but to actually live from compassion, to actually live from open heartedness or peace or joy. Um, I think it's all about what does our nervous system do naturally and how do we how do we get it to be more adaptable? That was very well said, Brooke. <laughs> really? Because I felt like <laughs> I was doing all just my things getting rambly. for me and for them <laughs> and those guys and, for some. <laughs> and sometimes. <laughs> well, I like it a lot. Good, thanks. Vote of confidence. I appreciate it. <laughs> It got me thinking too. I, I remember before we were going to interview Amoda Ma and I was preparing all of my questions and listening to her on Buddha at the gas pump and reading her book and everything. I remember I had pulled out a quote from her interview on Buddha at the gas pump where she mentioned something to the effect of um, that awakening really has to do with the nervous system at rest. Mm. but that most of us have so many reactivities built up in the system. I always get the image of like, kind of like gunk on a mechanism, you know, like just memories, traumas. Some teachers would say from many lives, some teachers may just point to this one and find that most useful, but that there's all this kind of gunk on the mechanism of our nervous system, our energy body, our subtle body. And that, that creates reactivities. And so we can't have access to a nervous system at rest. And I wanted to ask her that. And we just didn't have the opportunity. So it's still on my list for her. But then shortly after, I started preparing for Locke's interview. And I found Neelam's course. And so looks like we're here anyway. <laughs> right. Looks like we're Looks here like anyway. This is what we're interested in. <laughs> so we're interested. I just want to say before I forget, because my brain is definitely foggy today, that it is a complex topic. It's super complex, right? Like, you know, even I've taken Neelam's course, and I'm actually still in the middle of it because I couldn't attend and I'm listening to the recordings. There's, I think, nine hours in total. And Neelam basically said, I'm just going to be scratching the surface of this topic, just scratching the surface, I'm like nine hours on the nervous <laughs> system. And you're just scratching the surface, right? I mean, yogic philosophers um, and practitioners and tantric Buddhist practitioners, I mean, they've been talking about the physiology of awakening for a long, long time. And there's probably a lot that can be said. But let's just talk about, you know, what we what we're reading about and what we've been <laughs> yeah. experiencing, obviously, but just for all of you out there. Didn't you love? I know you did. I'm just going to speak for you. I know that you loved <laughs> what I loved about Locke which is when he said that he was of the human being lineage mm -hmm. and that we all have the capacity to awaken the way everybody sort of points to, but he didn't make it some out there obscure act of grace. It was really much more about um, how to shift so that you can, uh, bring attention to the aspect of awareness that is already awake, right? And that was really cool. And it got me thinking a few things like one, that the human being lineage where he believes that aw awakeness is sort of a developmental stage of a human, mm -hmm. like it's just part of the natural human development, 
therefore must point to our physiology. I mean, every other major transition we've ever had as a human involved some shift in our physiology, hormonal shifts, probably shifts in our neurotransmitters, shifts in like, I'm sure our neurobiological structures. So that's part of it. And that B, this ability to shift into what is already awake within you, what is already awakeness. That's interesting because it starts to get me thinking about the nervous system shifting from sympathetic to parasympathetic. Um, actually, yeah, that's it, period. I'm going to just end that sentence. That's what it gets me thinking of. Mm -hmm. And I have been experiencing, I mean, if you've all been listening, you may have heard our first episode on awakening in the nervous system. It's been such a close interest of mine because I've been observing how when I am able to be very like relaxed and open in my parasympathetic state, I have a whole different consciousness of the world, like a whole different experience of myself and others. And when I'm cranked into the sympathetic state of fight or flight, different dimension of reality, completely, mm -hmm. completely, sometimes as if they're inaccessible. If I'm lucky, what happens is I have an observing self while I'm in sympathetic crank. So I can be like, ah, oh, something's up. Mm -hmm. You know, you're not in your best state. This isn't quite, you're not seeing things quite clearly. You know, I can have some observing self. So I want to hear about both of our stories, but maybe we can just kick it off even deeper by bringing up something Neelam kept saying in the course, which is that awakening is very dependent upon the nervous system's ability to be present. Mm. And that if your nervous system does not have the capacity to be present, you will continually be projecting the past onto the present. Your brain and your fight or flight freeze nervous system will be um, triggered as if it is still in the past. And you won't have the clarity of discernment to be able to identify, oh, this is of the past and this is happening now. Right. And just to bring in a little something else that I don't, because I never remember anything after we've recorded it. I don't think we got into this with Locke, but it was my favorite question that we had written down in advance. That's just how it goes. But he pointed out, you know, as a spiritual teacher who's also a clinical psychologist, that the present is not the now. So that comes from Locke Kelly. And he said, because often what you'll see with people who are depressive is that they are, they feel trapped in the present, you know, so this, and I, I'm the depressive type. <laughs> and so that really resonated for me because I've, some people may remember, I've said it on other shows, a cue for me that I'm believing something that's not true is when I hear my mind say the lead in sentence, this is just my life now. There's just this way that I saran wrap the present moment and go, this forever and ever. Forever and ever. Nothing's ever going to get better, which is totally the depressive's pattern. Actually, I just want to note to you, when you've been enthusiastic, you do the same thing. That's this true, I do. I do. So sometimes it's like a projection <laughs> of great ever. bliss. That's true. <laughs> it's a, just I'm so that you know, just you're not just depressive. Is what we're saying. <laughs> I grab onto something and I say this forever. Forever and ever. I make it into a time capsule. Um, but I think it's a helpful differentiation because if we're talking about the nervous system's ability to be here, here doesn't actually mean the present tense. The present tense is still a large container that can be like, I'm 43. I live at this address. This is my job. Right now I'm worried about blah, blah, blah. And you kind of make it into these large trends about what your life is right now. Um, and that's the present here is the ongoing moment. Like if you push play on a movie, the movie's going to keep moving. <laughs> it's not a frozen screen of the woman in her apartment worrying about paying the electric bill for like a whole movie. It moves. So that can continuous here-ness, which is always ongoing, it can't be shrink wrapped. It can't be put in the time capsule, this forever and ever. <laughs> that is the now. So I, I just... For me, that's been such a helpful differentiation because I do the stuck in the 
present thing. And I ping pong between past and future all the time too, just like anyone with an ego structure does. But um, there's a way that the spiritual path can become quite depressing if we think what we need to do is just like soften into whatever we've decided our present is and say this for, uh, this is just my life now. <laughs> I'm going to be the spiritual mm. person who tolerates that this is this forever and ever. Maybe you can even share a little more about it because, you know, when I'm listening, I guess some of the confusion is, okay, so possibly what, and, and I, and I'm now like just talking out loud so I can sort through it in my head just in case anyone else has a question. So let's say we're suffering big time in this moment, mm -hmm. right? Well, one can imagine that perhaps we have really rough conditions in this moment, right? So really rough external circumstances. Um, and so not to say that every external circumstance that is rough will necessarily create suffering. But I mean, who are we all kidding? For most of us listening, if our external oh, yeah. circumstances get rough enough, we're probably going to suffer. And then the other is we keep projecting concepts. Yeah. And since those are born of the past, that's what I think is interesting about the here and the present conversation. Because mm -hmm. if you're really suffering, then either the external conditions are like pressing in on you, possibly. Maybe your body is really out of alignment, could be something physiological that's creating. But even then, often what's happening, I think, is your brain keeps projecting the past onto the present moment. So in theory, once we become present to this moment, to now, to hear whatever language we want to use, we can begin to see through those projections mm -hmm. and then actually meet the pain and a whole new thing can evolve. Yeah. So maybe if you share how it was helpful for you, it'll clarify it a little bit. How the Locke Kelly's yeah. clarification of that. Yeah, yeah, it's still it it's still pointing to what I think Amoda Ma, probably other teachers, calls the horizontal mind, which is you know you're going to the past, you're projecting it on the present, but really th this forever, this is my life now, is a projection onto the future too. Meaning it will mm -hmm. always mm -hmm. be like this. This flavor will mm -hmm. always be here. Um, so it still relies on past and future. And so there's just a way that the present becomes this larger shape, like broader trends that are completely dependent, like you were saying, on thought forms about the past and the future and not about whatever we're actually experiencing in the moment. So, you know, to give an example, um, when I was triggered recently about house hunting stuff, and I'll go into the story, but uh, I went hiking and like, it's such a great moment. Cause I, for me, connection with nature is such an important part of my life and it's always so opening and grounding and delightful. So it's easy for me to see that I'm blinded to that. So I can be sitting next to a running stream and instead of, Ooh, the water feels cool on my hand. The light looks so pretty on the stream. The sun feels so good on my skin. I'm sitting next to this miraculous experience. And I'm going, Oh my God, I hope I'm not making a mistake. The last time I tried to move, uh, I hope I don't, uh, Oh my God, this would be a disaster. I hope it doesn't, but I wonder if it's just thought forms and you're missing. I saw Jeannie Zandy for a night recently and she has like the most, oh, I, didn't get to I know ask you we about have to that. catch up on that. It was so good. <laughs> she has the most luscious language of any human being ever. I think. Yeah. She's so poetic. And so she was talking about this, um, hiking and just talking, she, the, the phrase she used is like missing the feast that you're, mm. that you can just, you can be out in the feast, walking, sun, leaves, air, company, whatever. And you can completely miss it because you're in thought forms. And that's everything that every spiritual teacher is talking about. And it's what we're talking about here too. So the now is a much, um, I don't know why I say bigger or smaller. It just feels that way. Cause it's not painted with a broad brush. It's experientially happening ongoing, like pushing yeah. play on the movie. Like the stream is, is moving. The water's moving. The light is glinting and the sun's hitting my skin. And then maybe a person comes along and they say, hi, now this is what's happening. Now I'm having a conversation with this person and then they leave. And then I see a fish and then I stand up. Like it's, it's ongoing and it's very small. 
yeah. moment. And in, and in a way, part of being here is recognizing everything's changing, right? Literally yeah, changing moment by moment. And nothing you're experiencing have you ever experienced before, mm-hmm. like ever, which yeah. is really a trip. It right. Is. I can have the same conversation with you. We're talking about the awakening nervous system again. And it's it'll never be like it was before. Mm-hmm. I'm not the same. You are not the same. The moment's not the same. The energy's not, you know, that's what's really interesting. That's part of what our brains or we could say ego structure um, struggle around acknowledging mm-hmm. that things don't repeat. And they're not forever encapsulated. And yeah. now it will always be like this, even when it's a beautiful moment sitting by a stream trickling, right? right? So interesting. And to go back to that, not to, you know, beat this to death, but just because I gave examples of past present thought forms sitting next to the stream, but you can also just what I would do in the present as a concept, as opposed to the here or now, it would be sitting next to the stream going, this is one of the hardest times of my life. I don't know if I'll make the right decision. Why can't it work out? You know, that's present. That's thinking about the present moment, but it's not what's what's actually happening is you're sitting next to a stream. (laughs) It doesn't mean you're not going to go home and whatever, make a hard phone call or tough decision, but it's not happening right now. And really the pain, even in the moments when we do make the decision or make the hard phone call or whatever, um, those are tiny moments too. <laughs> we just make them feel like giant shrink wrapped moments that are filled with all of this. This is the hard, this is the worst. This is the hardest. All that. Well, ma- maybe we can lay out a couple of concepts and then we can give personal examples. I remember learning a long time ago that the way that the brain functions is it essentially projects the past onto the present and the future, especially if it's in its default mode network, right? Mm-hmm. As soon as it's in its default architecture and these aspects of the brain that are trying to reduce the load and reduce the use of resources, it just keeps working from the architecture of the past and looking for what feels familiar. And then based on the level of familiarity, categorizing it as good, bad, safe, unsafe. And so Unless we're in the here, the brain has a way of painting the present and the future with the past, right? So then what's interesting, I think, is as I listened to Neelam, what started to connect for me is, so let's say, I might have used this example before when I was an acupuncture student and I was in the clinic studying, I had a good friend of mine who had a beard. And he was a practitioner, super nice guy. I love this guy, like really friendly, really lovely, super woman loving, like really good human being. And this female patient that he was seeing immediately did not like him and did not want to see him because she had had a past trauma with a man with a beard. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's as simple as that. Sometimes we're sort of lucky. I'm using that word very loosely enough to identify the trigger right? Like Mm -hmm. this is familiar and it's familiar to this. And so even though I know you're not that person, I really can't seem to be around you without my nervous system interacting. But sometimes we're not familiar. Think about how many things you don't have top of mind in your memory bank Mm -hmm. that could have happened to you. So what Neelam was pointing to that I thought was really interesting is in moments like that, when something has this familiar tone to it, and it triggers the brain and the nervous system to go, this is familiar, the nervous system will respond oftentimes the way it responded then. Hmm. So if it froze, if it placated, if it, you know, if it ran, either way, it's often a sense of overwhelm or shutdown, if we were to just make it more broad and categorical. But I thought that's really interesting. So there's some trigger of something being familiar. Your brain goes, oh, I know what this is. This is just like this thing I saw before. It assigns good or bad, which sometimes it assigns good to things that are not good for us because it felt familiar in our past. Like um, you could have a date, you could start dating someone and the way they treat you, treated you is kind of like how your parent treated you and you associated that with love and it feels familiar. So you could say, okay, that's good. Or you could say it's bad, but either way, we've already created, um, a projection 
on the moment. We've already decided something about what this will mean and who they are and who we are and what the roles will be. We've already decided something. Mm -hmm. And so I think once we recognize that and we start to go deeper and go, oh, and my nervous system is basically responding the way it responded. Mm -hmm. So what Neelam was saying is in those moments, and this is a great simplification, but just to give you this important information, open your eyes and take in data from the room around you. Let your brain fill up with information that it is not in that past moment because the brain can't differentiate, Mm -hmm. thinks the past has come to life again. So look around, take it in, feel the senses in your body because the senses are a gateway to the now experience. And then you'll start to shift. And then from that place, you'll also have discernment and you can meet these emotions and experiences in an entirely different way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in case this sounds so tidy, like, oh, good. I have the blueprint for how to never be triggered or how to get right (laughs) out of it. I would like to share. (laughs) (laughs) We wouldn't want it to sound tidy. (laughs) That would suck. No, not so tidy. So I recently am going through something that is like one of the human life's most common, most banal things, which is just house hunting and moving, right? Like it's really ordinary, except I have some triggers like really old school childhood, very unpleasant PTSD triggers around moving and everything about it, making a decision to move. Will I make the right decision? If I make the wrong decision, I will permanently and irreversibly ruin not just my life, but everyone I love's life. Like it it has that kind of thing. So (laughs) without without being conscious of that at all. I didn't go into it going, now, Brooke, remember, you have triggers around moving. This might get rocky. Nope. Instead, I surprised myself with the level of totally illogical terror, like animal brainstem terror about a move and inability to do what I coach people to do all the time, which is to discern. So I feel like I got this very painful, but really interesting, really wonderful tour through being profoundly triggered, like PTSD triggering, um, which I haven't had that level of it in, in many years. And when you and I were talking before the show, you were like, you know what this reminded me of (laughs) is when you were going through and I'm like, I know it's been so long since I've been in that place. Um, And what's interesting about now is that what I do have is awareness. So even though I had awareness, I'm really triggered. I'm really terrified. And yet nothing terrifying is happening at all. Um, I'm telling myself stories about the past and the future. I was aware of all of those things. Um, I was aware of how profoundly self-absorbed I became that because when you're terrified and it feels like a survival issue, it's all you care about. You can't think about or talk about anything else and you are become super needy <laughs> with the people around you because it's like that's – it has to be solved or you will die, you know. <laughs> so it's like the only thing you want to talk about. Um, I was aware of all of those things and I have lots of tools and I just couldn't get out of it because it went into – you know, for, for those of you listening who uh, have been through and experienced PTSD – They're just these kind of, this isn't actually anatomically what's happening, but it feels like these deep folds in the brain and something can get caught in there. And it's like, ugh, you know, to to unhook it is tough. So fortunately, at the same time that that was happening, I mean, I have the love and support of people like you and the rest of my community and great tools. And that helped, but I still, it was so like a hair's breadth away that I could go into this, like, not particularly functional, terrified place. Um, and I came across my friend, Liam Bowler, who does the podcast, the body awake. He did an interview with a man, Stanley Rosenberg, who talks about the, um, Dr. Stephen Porges came out with the polyvagal theory. And so this man, Stanley Rosenberg put together a book of just self-help for regulating your vagus nerve. 
So I am not an expert on the polyvagal theory. So even though I'm a body nerd and I did liberated body, I am not speaking from the place of, please let me explain this theory to you. What I'm saying is that as a person who was grateful to listen to Liam's podcast, it really illuminated some things for me in terms of awareness. And then it also gave me tools. So first in terms of awareness, um, there is the dorsal vagal branch. And for those of us who've experienced PTSD, there's a way that you can get caught in that dorsal vagal activity, which is immobilization. And it, it has a, it's freeze sound. You picture the scared animal on the forest floor freezing. And that's true. That's immobilization. But in a human life, it can also be just laying around in your house feeling terrified. And you know you're laying around in your house terrified, but you can't unhook from it, um, no matter how good your intentions. And um, so it helped for me to, to pull it out of a lot of the thought forms of why can't I? Why can't I disrupt this? What's wrong with me? Blah, blah. As soon as I could see it as like this physiological fact which I kind of had this vague understanding of before, but it was like, Oh God, what a relief. Like I always go to that default because my nervous system got wired that way at a really young age, like helpful information, even more helpful. <laughs> we're using these really simple techniques for regulating the nervous system, which I, those of you listening, I will link to <laughs> exactly what the book is. And hopefully he has a video, but there's this one very basic exercise I thought of you, Vanessa, because I think ultimately what he's doing, what you do is you interlace your hands, you put them behind your head, you're laying down, and without turning your head, you look to the right until you take a settling breath or a swallow, and then you do the same looking to the left. And ultimately, I think what it's trying to do, based on what I knew, know about the body, is to adjust the atlas. Mm. And I thought of you with your nuca treatments and how when he was on the wrong side. And it was so interesting because when I was really in terror and I first started doing the exercise, I know that I'm always out on the right. But I wasn't thinking about it. So I did the exercise. I looked to the right just with my eyes and I went into um, shake, like shaking terrified animal. I was like, fuck this. This isn't helpful at all. <laughs> so I was like, okay, I'm going to look to the left. As soon as I looked to the left, my whole system just calmed down. And so I, and then I was able to look to the right and I didn't get the super triggered response. So I started doing this daily and <laughs> like, I said this to you before, Vanessa, it's like recovering from the flu. You know, like you can, if you have the flu, you can't tell yourself it's just a virus <laughs> heal. Yeah. But if the physiological state of the fever has broken, flu has broken, comes along, you feel relief. And this was like, oh my, I finally have access again to sanity. I mean, I wasn't like a screaming, running around the neighborhood person, but just discernment, but basic you discernment. See clearly. No, yeah. like just to go, okay. And it, and I was able to tell myself before, you are not seeing clearly, this isn't true, but it didn't matter because I still right. felt terrified. But this was first the terrified went away and then it was like, okay, now I can discern about what's going on in my life. You know, am I in imminent danger? I notice now that I have been able to settle my nervous system, but then I'm not. And it, it just, I mean, it was a fascinating experience for so many reasons, like to have awareness and go through that kind of trigger. Cause the last, all the other times in my life that I have, I haven't had that level of awareness. And then to have tools that so quickly put me into a different place. Um, really fascinating. And it really gets me thinking about, um, I think a lot of us listening understand that we have sensitive nervous systems. And some of us listening know that we have experiences with PTSD and like, we need different care and feeding. <laughs> we need to make it a priority in our lives and not in the shh, shh, shh <laughs> calm down, self-soothing kind of ways. But I mean, how do we become as resilient, adaptable, well-regulated, flexible, pliable in our nervous systems as possible, as opposed to the like, because the sympathetic parasympathetic story is binary, right? Upregulate, right. downregulate. And then it's very, even though that's just a normal function of the nervous system, thank God we can do both. People tell a story about how one's better than the other. 
they're both equally good. They're, they're just keeping you alive. They're just taking care of the organism, you know? Um, so this put, took it into a different place where it wasn't just like, are you in the good one or the bad one? Do you need to calm down or speed up? It was like, no, what immobilization is immobilization. And then how do I get more flexible? Okay. Now I have a million things. I to know say. I, I over talked again. No, that was <laughs> awesome. And I'm like this and then this got my, uh, I'm actually got my energy rolling. Um, I remember back in the day and, and I don't know when that was since I have bad memory, but maybe it's five years ago, 10 years ago, whatever. I remember being obsessed with resiliency in the nervous system. I mean, I used to teach a lot about the nervous system and the window of tolerance and how to increase our window of tolerance. And then somewhere I think I got this sense, like that's not very spiritual. Like, you know, that's, yeah. Like it seemed always very neurobiological and mm. physiological and helpful for things like stress management. Like, not bad, not unuseful, but like, oh, okay, no, but now let me go to a spiritual path and like, right. you know, it's different. do Buddhist practices and read things. Right? And I just had that different because, you know, as I think I said with Locke Kelly, like when I thought about spirituality, it's always, you know, like, what are we really? Like, who are we? What's the point of humans existing? And what happens after we die? Like, that's my question. So it wasn't even like I was always trying to awaken you know, mm -hmm. that wasn't even on my mind. I'm sure if that was, I might have gotten into different physiological practices like they use in yoga all the time, kundalini practices and breathing practices. So I had it like so divided. So I always think it's funny now that I keep like, oh, that thing that I was studying and talking about is actually really important in the spiritual path. But what I was thinking about a lot of things, actually, when you were talking, Brooke, but one of them was Am I remembering correctly? Here's something that came into my mind. I feel like when you spoke with Jeannie Zandi about some of the terror that was mm -hmm. coming up for you at night, and we're calling it Dark Night of the Soul, but that when that was happening, I feel like at some point, Jeannie said something along the lines of, and way more poetically, I'm sure, <laughs> But like, sometimes it's not about meeting the terror, like you don't meet the terror. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, oftentimes, if people listen to us, they know we're often about like, how can we meet this energy that's in our body, this emotion in our body, it was like, stop meeting it. You, you can't, you have to first find ground, like <laughs> first find safety. Yeah, right. I'm laughing because I'm like, I should go back and listen, should have listened to that after the fact. Yeah, that would have been Actually, a good reminder. It don't just keep occurred turning to me, but I'm like, towards terror. Maybe not yeah. helpful when you have PTSD Wait. and you immobilize. <laughs> right. Right. Like there's a certain degree. It's making me think that, you know, there's a degree of getting caught into the past, you know, just to put it that way for now, that is probably so deep, so visceral, so contracted that there is literally almost no discernment, right? Like almost um, no yes. capacity for discernment. I can tell you from a recent tour, no Been capacity there. for discernment. No <laughs> capacity for discernment. Even if you have witnessing self and observing self still, no capacity for actual discernment, meaning ability to shift and disidentify and like have a new perspective and have a new experience. And so by coming back to safety, which could also be described as doing these practices to soften the vagal nerve or tone the vagal nerve. I don't know the right terminology, um, shifting into the parasympathetic. If you're listening to Locke, he might talk about unhooking from something and shifting into awareness. So that's really interesting for certain emotions, or maybe it's fair to say just for certain states when you're that contracted in it, when it's that hooked you can't just do what we would normally recommend, which is meet it first. And this is what I think Neelam was saying. First, you have to be able to be here. Mm -hmm. If you can't recognize that you're here, you know, so often like what you were describing sitting by the stream or, you know, in bed at night, we can sometimes experience emotions or we're sitting in our house on the couch ruminating if we really were to breathe with our eyes open and look around and take in the surroundings of the present moment, we don't have the problems we think we have often, mm -hmm. right? It's not the emergency we think it is. It's not um, as familiar as we had automatically assumed it was. 
So I think that that's a really interesting thing. It's like, okay, sometimes it's like, duh. It's almost I always remember, like, duh. <laughs> like how many me. times do you have to like learn the same thing before we own it? But I remember studying self-compassion work with Kristen Neff. Have you ever Oh, yeah. Her, Look at her, her stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's really lovely. For anyone listening who's grappling with self-compassion, Kristen Neff has it going on. And I remember her saying, you know, so often, like, let's say, um, okay, I'll give my example. I, <laughs> this is going to sound so stupid, but I was triggered because my daddy was upset with me. <laughs> I don't use the word. I have to move. Yeah, I know you don't say daddy. (laughs) I don't use the word daddy for everyone listening. That sounds somehow weird. I'm 44. No, I was making fun of myself by using that word. But what had happened was I was coming back to New York to see the family. I thought I was planning a very nice trip. My parents were disappointed. I wasn't staying longer and I could feel their disappointment and they expressed their disappointment. My whole physiology got changed, right? I went right into fight or flight kind of mode. My mind started racing because all of these sort of, um, well, we used to call them pain bodies, right? Mm -hmm. We could say triggers, we can say states of being, whatever they are. They have thoughts that go with them, feelings that go with them, and belief systems that go with them. Those are sometimes the trickiest to see. So I'm all triggered. And now I'm thinking, I should just kill myself. But but meanwhile, it's not like I don't like myself. I'm into myself now. That's gone. I'm not a problem. But that's the thought that comes along with this trigger, which, you know, poor little Vanessa. No wonder I was like dreaming about killing myself and wishing I could like break my legs and someone pay attention to me. You know, it's like there was, I know, right? Oh, oh, yeah. oh, and, and so that kind of thought form is part of what was happening in my nervous system when I used to go through whatever traumatic experiences I went through. Okay. So here's what's up. My dad's disappointed in me. I'm empathetically feeling the resonance of the disappointment. So that's a piece, but I'm also projecting like, Oh, he's always going to be upset. And now he's hurt and poor guy, they're older. Right. So I'm ascribing all sorts of meaning to it. And now I'm anxious and it's in the back of my mind all day, just like you were describing Brooke, right? Like I'm caught in that kind of self-absorption loop. It's not intense because it's a minor anxiety, but it's there, right? Like anytime someone's not talking to me, I'm back into that. What am I going to do about this state? So formerly in my life and what many of you may do is we think, all right, I'm just going to talk myself through it. You know how you said like no amount of like, Hey, Brooke, there's nothing to worry about. You're just moving houses. (laughs) Really? There's lots of houses in the world. People do it all the time. It's really not a big deal. Oh, good point. Yeah. Like, (laughs) oh, great. Thank you for pointing that out to me. I feel so much better. Like that doesn't work. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I knew this from studying self-compassion with Kristen Neff. It doesn't work on a brain level. It doesn't work on a nervous system level. You can't rationalize when your brain is triggered into its fear centers or emotional centers like the limbic system. So once your limbic system is activated and the fight, flight, freeze, placate mechanisms are running the show, you can't access the frontal part of your brain where logic and rationality exist. You also can't access, therefore, love, compassion, forgiveness, and all of those types of really frontal cortex states. So what happens is, We get into this and then we're like, it'll be okay, Vanessa, you're 44 years old. Like your dad's been disappointed before, you know, in fact, no matter how much I do, they tend to be in that state. So that's just to be expected. Right. And I can talk it through, but none of it's alleviating the anxiety. Same thing. Let's say you go, well, I want to learn a lesson. And so self-compassion people are like, but you know, I did the wrong thing. I should have thought about it differently. And they're trying to talk themselves through it. But what Krista Neff taught was until you can get out of that reptile brain, until you can get out of the limbic system and into the frontal cortex, you can't access logic, reason, love, compassion, ease, and all of these other places. We could say, Matt would say you can't access your soul, right? La Kelly would say you can't access awake awareness, So who knows what it is? We can look at it from different ways. So 
finally, it seems that it's always circling back to the first thing you have to do before you can meet that experience from the level of awake awareness, from the level of compassion, from the part of you that genuinely can feel it is you first have to soften to safety. Mm -hmm. And oh my God, how many times have we talked about this, Brooke? Because Kieran was huge on this. I know. Find safety first. Find safety. But we don't always know what safety looks like or feels like or how to find safety, which is part of what that tool gave you. Yeah. And when you're in just like wounded animal, we're not so handy with our self-help tools or whatever, you know, even in this interview on the body awake, he was like, yeah, well, you know, of course it's not like a permanent fix. We're alive. Lives affect us. And when people are depressed or when people are triggered, um, they're less likely to do their self care. It's like, yeah, you know, it's just a really basic fact. But if something lands in your lap, as it did for me this time, quite literally, I was like, Oh, that, you know, and you can give it a try. And it works, but yeah, it's not always when you're genuinely triggered and you, like you said, don't have access to the parts of your brain that are different levels of consciousness, more mature levels of consciousness than just base survival. What about me? I'd better make sure I get out of this thing alive. And this thing is usually an idea or concept, not even like I'm in the middle of a battlefield or something. Um, It's not the easiest. And, And then I think because we are in the binary part of our brains within a binary culture, what we do is we assume we need to suppress ourselves and just calm calm it down, calm it down. And it's it's really not about putting a lid on ourselves, which we've also talked about plenty. Um, So I don't know. I'm really, really interested in this conversation and experience of what is a nice adaptable, flexible nervous system. And I know I'm not alone in my interest, but it's just really landed in a way where I'm like, okay, this has been a super helpful tool for me in a tough time. And it's really changing the way I think about everything. It's the way I think about this path. It's the way I think about um, (laughs) politics in the state of our country. (laughs) It's the way I think about my work with my clients when I'm working as a body therapist or manual therapist. And like, it's not just about convincing the tissue to let go by putting a certain kind of pressure on it. Can we get their nervous system to feel totally in a safe place first by working on vagal tone? Um, so more to come on this because I'm, it's one of those things that landed for me in a like, okay, this feels really important and relevant and helpful. And so different than just the binary idea of like, well, I'm really revved up. I'm afraid I'm uh, I'm in sympathetic nervous system. Calm down, calm down, which just has not when you're somebody who goes into immobilization, that does not feel good. It does not help. No. It goes to a well, bad place. And, and remember, even that voice is probably just a voice you employed when your nervous system was accelerated at some point in the past. Totally. Right. So even that, that's what's crazy. Someone else may say, Go give them a piece of your mind. Give them a piece of your mind, right? right. Like not Instead calm down. Like, Shh, you're going to be fine. You're fine. <laughs> right. Just rock back and forth and <laughs> <laughs> pretend you care what they're talking about, right? Like ev- even in that moment, there's still the overlays. That's what's tricky. It's like how we're thinking about it and conceiving of it and the meaning we're applying. Like, for example, if you go, I should be able to get myself out of this. And I can't get myself out Mm -hmm. of this. Therefore, I'm a defective human being who is always doomed to this. Right. Right. All just our meaning that we keep applying. I mean, I think it's just interesting because there's just so many ways to come about it because it's a mystery because ultimately we are mysteries. You know, us human beings are mysteries. And and maybe there's just different medicine for different people at different moments. But when I think about Spending time with Kieran, for example, speaking about pain bodies and and the architecture of our belief systems and um, sort of using Byron Katie style reality testing questions with it. That's useful because then when you're in a reactive state, you have some measure of ability to have been observing self with the types of beliefs that are running through your mind that actually just aren't true. And now you might know they're not true. You might remember, right? You might have a seed. 
So that's helpful. And then doing Jeannie Zandi's benevolent thief meditation where you're just finding safety in the now is helpful. And Neelam's keeping your eyes closed. So everyone's going to find their kind of own way in Mm -hmm. and to keep practicing. But I do believe that as we keep finding the capacity to be in the present, which is possibly possibly when Eckhart Tolle would talk about be here, you know, like, or we'd get the concept like, oh yeah, be here now. That sounds so nice. Not so easy, (laughs) right? Not so easy that these reactivities, they are intergenerational. They are possibly karmic past life. And they are certainly in our own lives and our own traumas and our own past. So maybe not so easy, to develop the bandwidth to be here, because if we are present, we're going to feel all the feels. Mm -hmm. That's part of being present, right? It's part of why we, we shut down out of overwhelm. But I do believe that as that capacity develops, even if it's a little at a time, right? Like you can be present with one emotion, but not a different kind with one thing, but not a different thing that as we keep developing that capacity, that eventually I do think we start to clear out these reactivities And then those tools, you and I have said this in different ways about different things, those tools just become either irrelevant or part of us. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like you don't need to default to them. Like I don't have to sit around. Matt Kahn offers a beautiful um, parasympathetic, soothing kind of exercise by simply putting your hands on your heart and saying, I love you. Super great. Super oxytocin inducing. Really good for us. After a while, You don't even have to do that anymore because you love yourself. Yeah. It's just there, right? So I think, and I think, honestly, when all those reactivities are cleared out, I think that's when you're stabilized in awakened state. Yeah, I think so too, which is just endlessly fascinating to me to see how this is a parallel thing. Like you were saying before, it's not like the spiritual path's over there and the maturation and flexibility of the nervous system is over here. Same, same. They are the same thing, I think. I, I stay tuned. That's where that's they're where at we're at. Highly interrelated. We can say. Well, that. they're definitely. High. I've I've been seeing it all year. You're seeing it all year. How how the two are dancing with each other. We're no experts. There are people listening who are probably more expert. I have a lovely client who's a listener who does so well with this stuff. Maybe I'll ask her if I can share her resource. Um, but I want to share one simple little exercise that someone um, I was friends with who's now passed away used to offer because it really had me thinking about Neelam, but he was really coming from an energy perspective. Neelam um, speaks a lot about the neurobiology of it, but he used to say when people seemed really triggered, he would have you look around the room and start to notice. No, let me begin again. What he would really start with is you would say your name, right? So I'd say like I'm Vanessa Ann Scotto. You would say your age, I'm 44 years old. He'd say, where are you right now? He'd say, I'm in a bedroom in Austin, Texas. And he would say, now look around the room and describe it. Hmm. What's the light like? What's the color like? What does the temperature feel like on your skin? You know, what can you be aware of in your surroundings? And you would start to describe, you know, everything. You know what? I see some natural sunlight and the air feels a little cool on my skin. And you would come into the present moment, come into the now, and you would start to settle, which is really interesting. And I found that useful. And I found him using it with clients again, Mm -hmm. that it's back just based on what Neelam taught us about having the eyes open. Like, so often when I meditate as a sensei, I like interoception, I close my eyes, I can have all sorts of wild experiences that way. But the brain doesn't have that opportunity to catch up to be in the present with whatever's arising. And it's only when we could be in the present. And I know you use that term differently, you know, so I don't want to confuse everybody, but the now with whatever's arising, that then it can be set free. Like then it can heal and we can start to tolerate all of these different triggers. So we can reduce the reactivities in our system. And I think that's just a pretty easy, helpful tool. Yeah, it's a good one. Thank you so much for listening to today's show. 
The show notes, including all of the resources that we mentioned in this episode, live at blizzandgrit.com. Head on over to the website and scroll down and you'll see each episode separate post. We put the resources right in there. Our member platform is at patreon.com backslash bliss and grit. We rely on subscribers and this is a place where you can go donate to the show and also get some great rewards for your support. If you've been wanting to engage in these types of topics in a deeper way with us, it's a great place to go for a more immersive experience. Also, come play with us on Instagram and Facebook. There's a lot of lively conversation happening over there. And honestly, we love connecting and hearing from all of you. We're so grateful for the reviews that so many of you have written. It really touches our heart and most especially for the membership support that many of you have provided. Till next week, everyone.